This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, students. So we'll continue from where we left off last class. We were discussing about the sources of radiation in UV visible instruments. We have seen in general what are the requirements for sources, uh, how much uh, they, that uh, radiation should be uh, stable, of stable intensity, it should be of sufficient intensity, and also you should have continuous radiation. Uh, this is what where we stopped. And we have also seen the uh, different types of sources that are generally used in UV visible spectroscopic instruments. So we'll continue with the e discussing in detail about each of these sources, starting with the tungsten filament lamp. Now I had uh, also told you uh, in the last class that there are uh, different types of uh, sources in UV visible instruments. Some sources which are useful for getting only visible radiation, some which are pure UV sources and others which are combination sources, that is, they give both UV and visible radiation. So tungsten filament lamp is used for visible radiation. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, nothing but a, a normal household bulb. Where you have a tungsten filament, so this is the tungsten filament. When it is electrically heated, then it starts glowing. Okay, That glowing is nothing but emission, uh, visible light being emitted. This is an evacuated glass bulb. And since it is made up of glass, uh, you can uh, get only visible radiation. Any UV radiation that is emitted, that is having wavelength shorter than 320 nanometer, will be absorbed by this glass filter. So this tungsten filament lamp emits radiation in the near visible and near IR regions. The reason for this is uh, in the visible and in the near IR regions. Because the energy distribution of this lamp is temperature dependent. And in most uh, cases, the operating filament temperature would be 2900 Kelvin. At this temperature, you will see that the lamp will emit radiation in the visible region and in the near IR regions. Now, when you're using uh, this lamp as a source for visible radiation, then the IR radiations are interfering radiations. We cannot use them because they cannot be detected with the same detector as the visible radiation. UV and visible together can be de 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 detected by the same detector and hence they can be used together. But we cannot use IR with, near, uh, with visible because the detection of IR radiation needs different types of detectors. So now, uh, how does this operate? And uh, yes, uh, because of this near IR region, actually 80% of the radiation emitted by this lamp is in the near IR region. And it's only the remaining 20% which gets emitted in the visible region. And that is why the intensity of radiation emitted by this lamp is not very high. It's uh, sufficient for most of the applications, but it is not very high for uh, specific applications. So if you need a highly intense visible source, then you have to go for the next one, which I had listed up. That's the carbon arc. So how does this operate? Uh, this is an evacuated bulb on heating. This tungsten gets excited and it starts emitting radiation. What if we uh, increase? I also told the energy distribution of this lamp is temperature dependent. That means depending on the operating filament temperature, the radiations are emitted. So if you're operating at 2900 Kelvin, then the radiation is emitted in the visible and in the near IR regions. But if you operate at higher temperatures, then you can get radiation being emitted in visible and UV. And this was tried out 
but the problem was uh, that was seen was at higher temperatures than 2900 kelvin the tungsten filament clamp snaps or breaks um, very fast so the lamp's life is greatly reduced and this was uh, found to be a practical problem which uh, was not at all desirable it was better to have visible and near ir regions and the lamp lasting for a longer time and that's why at present it is continued with operating at 2900 kelvin with radiation being emitted in visible and near ir regions now this near ir region is not desirable uh, near IR radiations and therefore to avoid this or to eliminate this we use heat absorbing filters so where is this placed this is placed between the source and the next component that's the wavelength selector so even if near IR radiations are being emitted by this source they will be absorbed by the filter that is present here and they never pass uh, uh, through the wavelength selector so there's no question of them falling on the sample. So this way, it's a widely used uh, lamp, reasonably uh, cheap. So it's widely used and lasts long enough, uh, widely used in the visible region. The second lamp which gives visible light is the carbon arc lamp. And this is how it looks. So you see, uh, it's a more intense source of visible radiation. How does it work? A spark or electric arc is produced through air between the two carbon rods. These are the two carbon rods and they're placed very close to each other. When you pass, uh, when you have a potential difference between these two, then you will see uh, an electric arc being produced. And that arc is actually the visible radiation that is being produced. So the gap between the rods must be of sufficient size. If the gap is too big, then the arc may flicker or go out. That means you don't get any light being emitted. If the arc is too narrow, that means the gap is very less, then less light is produced. So accordingly, it is used. But this is used only when you need very high intensity visible radiation. Otherwise, tungsten lamp is the lamp of choice in spectroscopic instruments next we have the tungsten halogen lamp these are different forms of the tungsten halogen lamp you would have heard the halogen lamp uh, it's also called the halogen lamp um, this um, tungsten iride lamp also it is called um, there is a very small difference between the tungsten lamp and the tungsten halogen lamp but that gives rise to very uh, different features. First of all, uh, like when I had classified, I put this lamp under combination source that is emitting UV and visible radiation. Whereas tungsten lamp emits only visible radiation. Okay, uh, So that's the major difference. And how is this brought about? So the other difference is in tungsten lamp, there was a glass envelope the glass envelope was used because only it was being used only for visible radiation the tungsten uh, lamp used to emit radiations roughly from uh, 320 nanometers to 2400 nanometers um, that's into the near ir region so uh, we had seen that it is 320 this lower limit 320 was because of the glass envelope because glass starts absorbing wavelengths below 320 uh, now here instead we are having a quartz envelope quartz is transparent to uv radiations also so that is why any uv radiations that are emitted from uh, this uh, fil tungsten filament will easily go out of the lamp so it can be used by us in the spectroscopic instrument so this is a quartz envelope and also it has a small quantity of iodine present inside this evacuated quartz envelope a small very small quantity of iodine is present the operating temperature of this lamp is 3500 kelvin now earlier we saw that 
if the tungsten lamp is operated at temperatures higher than 2900 Kelvin, the life of the lamp drastically reduced. But in this case, it was seen that even on operating at 3500 Kelvin, the life of the lamp is doubled compared to tungsten lamp. And by operating at this higher temperature of 3500 Kelvin, we will be getting from tungsten, we will be getting radiation in the UV and the visible regions. No IR radiations are emitted now. It is only UV and visible radiations being emitted now. So both the problems got solved. Now we have only UV visible radiations and the life of the lamp is also doubled. How, was the, how is this happening? When it was decreasing the life in the tungsten lamp, the whole thing is achieved with that small quantity of iodine that is present in this lamp. Now why was the life of tungsten lamp drastically reducing at higher temperatures? Because the higher the temperatures, more the sublimation of tungsten from the tungsten filament. So from this filament, there is loss of tungsten as it gets converted into gas. So once it gets converted to gas, the filament becomes thinner and thinner and it snaps. That was the problem in tungsten lamp. But in this case, what happens is here also sublimation does occur. That is tungsten gets converted to gas. So it leaves the filament. But now it reacts with the iodine that is present and forms gaseous WI2 molecules. These gaseous WI2 molecules, that is tungsten iodide molecules, tend to diffuse back towards the hot filament where they redeposit, they dissociate and redeposit as tungsten atoms. So what, ha what is actually happening? There is a loss but there is redeposition and that's why the thickness of the tungsten filament is maintained. So you have a loss by sublimation but after sublimation tungsten, gaseous tungsten which is formed that reacts with I2, iodine that is present forms gaseous WI2 molecules. These tend to diffuse back towards the hot filament then they dissociate and again W that is tungsten gets redeposited on the filament as tungsten atoms. So this procedure helps to ensure that the filament is maintained in its original state for a longer time and that's how the life of the lamp is doubled in case of tungsten halogen lamp which we don't see in tungsten lamp and hence it, per it permits operation at a higher temperature of 3000 500 Kelvin 2, which gives us useful UV and visible radiation. Here also we see that the intensity of light that is emitted is much greater and uh, since it produces UV visible radiation, it's a very useful lamp. It's particularly very useful in plurimetric uh, instruments because there we always require both UV and visible incident light because different samples can be excited by different region radiations. So this is about tungsten halogen lamp. It's also a continuum source used uh, in both UV and visible regions. Next you have the deuterium lamp. This is a pure UV source. It's the most intense source of UV radiation. It, uh, here what is the principle involved? Electrical excitation of deuterium at low pressure produces UV radiations. You have two electrodes and uh, in a uh, chamber or in a uh, tube which is filled with deuterium. And electrical excitation because when you apply a potential between the two electrodes then you can uh, electrically excite deuterium that is present in between. And this deuterium on getting excited by electrical energy uh, forms the excited D2 star molecule. This is the excited molecule of deuterium. Excited molecule of deuterium is not stable and hence it dissociates giving two deuterium atoms and releasing one ultraviolet photon. 
This is how when number of deuterium molecules get excited and release UV photons, then you see UV radiation being emitted from this lamp. Very good source and uh, pure, why we say it's a pure UV source? Because as you saw in the table last class, it uh, roughly gives radiation from 160 to 375 nanometers. And UV region is 180 to 380 nanometers. So it covers the entire uh, region of UV. And hence, it's a very good source for UV radiations. And it's a pure UV uh, so, so it uh, gives you only UV radiation. Very high intensity, the most highly intense uh, source of UV radiation. Its uh, drawback or you can say demerit is it's quite expensive lamp. But uh, on the plus side you have um, its life is also quite long. So it lasts for a longer time though it is more expensive. Then you have the hydrogen lamp, similar to the deuterium lamp, only difference being that the this bulb inside is filled with hydrogen at low pressure. So electrical excitation of hydrogen at low pressure produces UV radiation. It's a less intense source of UV radiation than the deuterium lamp. So here you have hydrogen being excited. Same way you have the two electrodes, your apply potential and that uh, causes uh, current to flow. So hydrogen gets excited by the electrical energy to give H2 star molecule that is excited hydrogen. Excited hydrogen being unstable dissociates to give two hydrogen atoms releasing one UV photon. So this is how ultraviolet photons are emitted and then you get ultraviolet uh, radiation being emitted from this lamp. Is also a good source, um, may not be as uh, intense. The lamp also emits radiation from 160 to 375 nanometers, just like the deuterium lamp. Next, you have the xenon discharge lamp. Here you see um, this lamp is uh, again a combination lamp. That means it emits radiation in the UV region as well as in the uh, visible region. So it's a source for both UV radiations and visible radiations. Whenever you have combination lamps, these are more useful uh, in the, um, they're more useful for um, fluorescence instruments because that instrument requires a source of both UV and visible radiation. So with a single lamp, our purpose would be served there. That's why these combination lamps have found more use there. So how does this work now? Uh, it's construction and working. Uh, xenon gas is stored at, in here, xenon gas is stored at 10 to 30 atmospheres. You have the two tungsten electrodes. They are separated roughly by 8 millimeter. Uh, again, the gap, whenever you have an arc uh, lamp, then uh, you have to be very careful with the gap between the electrodes because otherwise the arc is not produced. So here it is 8 mm. By applying low voltage, an intense arc is produced. The intensity of radiation produced is greater than that of hydrogen lamp. It is less than that of deuterium lamp, but it is greater than that of hydrogen lamp. It gives you both UV radiations as well as visible radiations. And lastly, you have the mercury arc lamp. Here also you see it's an arc lamp. So here also you have the two electrodes and mercury vapor is stored under high pressure. Electrical excitation of Mercury atoms will result in the emission of radiation. But this is a line source because mercury uh, will be emitting only at its characteristic wavelengths. So it's a line source, but it emits both in the UV as well as in the visible region. Hence again, this is used in fluorescence instruments, particularly fluorimeters, not in spectrofluorimeters because spectrofluorimeters preferably use continuum sources. This is not a continuum source. Uh, 
and hence uh, it is used um, in only in fluorimeters that is the filter instruments which are used for measuring fluorescence. So now we come to the next uh, component in UV visible instruments. Uh, we have finished with the first component that is the radiation sources. And we have also seen that all these radiation sources, they are polychromatic sources. None of them are monochromatic source. Like I told you earlier, the only pure monochromatic source would be a laser. But how many lasers can be supplied with one instrument? because you need to work at different wavelengths for different substances. Um, so that is why polychromatic sources are used. But now our requirement is to get monochromatic radiation because spectroscopy is governed by Beer Lambert's law, which states the use of monochromatic radiation. Monochromatic radiation means radiation, having a beam of radiation, having one single discrete wave. Okay, now, so we have a device which is called a wavelength selector, as the name implies. Uh, it, this device selects wavelengths from the incident light. So it is a device that restricts the radiation being measured to a narrow band. You will not get absolute monochromaticity with any wavelength selector, but you will get good monochromatic, uh, close to monochrom uh, close to absolute monochromaticity with good wavelength selectors. That means now you have, say, visible radiation from 380 to 780 nanometers being emitted from, say, a tungsten lamp. You want only a 500 nanometer wavelength for exciting your sample. So you have to choose a wavelength selector that will allow 500 nanometer to pass through, but it will stop all other radiations. Now the wavelength selectors that we have, the, none of them will allow a single wavelength to pass. Instead, they allow a narrow band to pass. That means a few wavelengths on either side of 500, plus or minus, okay? So suppose it is plus minus uh, one, then it is, it would be 499 nanometer, 500 nanometer, and 501 nanometer passing through your wavelength selector. This will not only be 490, only three wavelengths, it will also have fractions of the wavelength. So it could be 499.1, 499.2, 499.3, and so on. So the number of wavelengths are more. So if your uh, wavelength selector is a good one, then you may even have just three wavelengths like 499.9, 500, and 500.1 passing through. Why do we need these wavelength selectors? The, left, the lower the number of wavelengths that are passing through a wavelength selector, the lower the number of wavelengths incident on the sample, or then we can ensure that only the sample will be absorbing the radiation that is incident on it, not any other component that is present in the sample solution. So we will be increasing the selectivity of our instrument. We are ensuring that only the sample responds. So that can be done by using a good wavelength selector. Moreover, when we ensure high selectivity, we can also ensure sensitivity. Sensitivity means how small a concentration, uh, how small a concentration that could be determined. So uh, if you don't have interferences by other substances and solution, then sample, though it is present only two molecules, it will be absorbing the radiation and it gets detected. So the sensitivity also increases. And the other advantage in case of UV visible uh, spectroscopy is it increases the likelihood of adherence to Beer's law. 
the more narrower the band of radiation that is going to fall on the sample, the more the uh, adherence to Beer's law. And uh, over a wider concentration range, we could say that A equals epsilon BC, or A is proportional to C. So this is, uh, these are the advantages of using wavelength selectors. So this is an output of a wavelength selector. Con consider that radiation is passing, is being emitted from the source. It is passing through a wavelength selector and directly falling on the detector. Then you will get the output of the wavelength selector. There is no sample in between. So this will be radiant power on the y-axis uh, plotted against the wavelength on the x-axis. So the effective bandwidth is the width of the band in wavelength units at half the height. Here it is shown. This is effective bandwidth. How do you calculate? Because effective bandwidth is a way of characterizing the wavelength selectors. That means, um, how would you say that a particular wavelength selector is a good one or not a good one? Because I've been telling that uh, some wavelength selectors are good, some wavelength selectors are not uh, that good. Um, this is based, of course, it depends upon um, how many wavelengths are passed by a given wavelength selector. And that, in turn, is seen from the effective bandwidth. So a good quality wavelength selector would have effective bandwidths of plus minus 0.1 nanometer. Then that's what is the example I gave a little time back. That is 499.9. 500 and 500.1 uh, going through the wavelength selector. So the effective bandwidth is you, uh, if you see the output like this, then you uh, see what is the half height here. And at half the height, see what is the width of the peak. So the width of the band in wavelength units, because like I said, effective bandwidth is plus minus 0.1 nanometer. So nanometer is the wavelength unit. So in wavelength units, the width of the band at half peak height. That is effective bandwidth. This is a way to characterize um, the um, different wavelength selectors. Now, there is another way also, which is uh, by the use of the term band pass. So what is band pass? It is the... Um, width of the band at baseline. So at the base of the peak, what is the width of the band? So from here to here, this would be the band pass. So the band pass is greater than the effective bandwidth. But the effective bandwidth is more practically more useful because at any, even the extreme ends of the effective bandwidth, so the wavelengths corresponding to this, at this point also, you have sufficient radiation intensity going through the wavelength selector. But if you consider the band pass, at the extreme edges of the band pass, the intensity of radiation passing through the wavelength selector is very low. It cannot be used at that wavelength. So there is no use of telling the band pass is from so much wavelength to so much wavelength because it cannot be used at the, all these wavelengths. Extreme sites you cannot use. You can only use the central part because at the, in the central part, sufficient intensity is being emitted. Okay, That's why effective bandwidth is nowadays more commonly used to characterize these uh, wavelength selectors. Uh, but uh, just for information's sake, band pass it is another term also used to characterize wavelength selectors. There are two types of wavelength selectors, broadly speaking. You have filters and monochromators. I've been telling you since we started talking about instruments, uh, we have seen that there are different types of instruments like a colorimeter has a filter as a wavelength selector, a photometer has a filter as a wavelength selector, a uh, spectroflow photometer has a monochromator as a wavelength selector. We had seen that. So now we come to the wavelength selectors, the different types, filters and monochromators. 
Each of these types can be again subdivided and we are going to study two different types of filters. One is interference filters, the other is absorption filters. Under monochromators, we'll be seeing two types of monochromators, gratings, uh, a grating monochromators and prism monochromators. So the monochromators have the advantage over filters in that they can be used for continuous scanning of wavelengths over the entire region or over any entire region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Filters, however, to, uh, can uh, measure only at specific wavelengths in a region. So first for the interference filter, this can be used with UV visible and IR radiation up to 14 microns. So up to 14 microns, you can be using uh, these interference filters. So for its operation, this uh, interference filter relies on optical interference to provide a relatively narrow band of radiation. So you all rem uh, hopefully remember what is interference, optical interference. So that is the principle of these interference filters and how it produces a narrow band of radiations. And so it consists of very thin layer of transparent material. This is the one here. It, this is, of course, a very magnified view. So it consists of a very thin layer of transparent material, usually calcium fluoride or magnesium fluoride. This layer is coated on both sides with a film of metal. So you will have a film of metal on this side and on this side, a film of metal. This, I'm calling it a film of metal because it will be very thin coating. This film should be so thin that it transmits, that film should be able to transmit approximately half the radiation striking it and reflect the other half. So the me metal layer is used because it's a reflective surface, but it, it should be so thin that half of it will go through the metal layer and half will get reflected. That's why we say the central transparent layer of calcium fluoride or magnesium fluoride is coated on both sides by a film of metal thin enough to reflect half the radiations falling on it and transmit the other half. This entire uh, array is sandwiched between two glass plates. These are the glass plates. So they are uh, sandwiched between two glass plates. The glass plates have only one role that is to protect this uh, array, sandwiched array or the actual filter from the atmosphere. It gives it protection. So uh, it does not get damaged. Now you see the radiation is falling here. Okay. It falls on the first metal layer. So approximately half will get uh, transmitted, half will get reflected. The reflected portion we are not interested in. What gets transmitted passes through the transparent layer and hits the inner surface of the second metal layer. Again, this metal layer is thin enough to transmit half and reflect half. So it will transmit half and reflect half. Okay. Now what is getting reflected from the inner surface of the second metal layer if it is of proper wavelength, so this radiation, if it is of proper wavelength, then it will get reflected from the inner portion of first metal layer in phase with the incoming radiation of the same wavelength. So suppose this radiation and this radiation had the same wavelength. Imagine that both had the same wavelength. And that wavelength is suitable for the thickness of this transparent layer. Then you will see that the first wavelength, first radiation will undergo transmission, reflection from the inner portion of second layer. Then it gets trans, uh, hit here. And again, reflection from the inner portion of first layer 
in phase with incoming radiation of the same wavelength. So both will get added up. And hence, you have increase in intensity of radiation at this point itself. This continues and finally you have high intensity for that wavelength only. That is nothing but constructive interference. The other wavelengths which will get uh, removed here or uh, even if they are transmitted, they are transmitted here, they get reflected but their phase uh, will be different from, the, they will be out of phase from the incoming radiation of a different wavelength. Because if you see wavelengths, uh, one radiation of a particular wavelength will, have, will be represented by a wave like this. See? Like this. Another of a shorter wavelength would be, say, represented like this. So uh, what I want to tell you uh, at this point is, if you have different wavelengths like this, they are said to be out of phase. Because one is at a peak, other is uh, at the trough. So they are considered out of phase, partly out of phase, completely out of phase is different aspects. But they are out of phase. Now, if you had a second radiation, which had exactly uh, the same wavelength as the first, then it would follow exactly this type of curve. Then we would say the second wavelength is in phase with the first wavelength. And such, whenever you have such things here, in phase radiations will add up and it gives constructive interference. So how is it decided which uh, wavelength is going to undergo constructive interference and which wavelength is going not going to undergo constructive interference? So that all depends upon the thickness of this transparent layer. So this is spacer at half wavelength for the desired wavelength or a multiple of that. So uh, suppose you, you desire 500 nanometers. So the spacer should be, the thickness should be half of that wavelength. So 250, if you want 500 nanometer to undergo constructive interference, you will use 250 nanometer uh, thickness of that transparent layer. Then you will get 500 nanometer undergoing constructive interference. Does this mean that uh, for uh, 99 nanometer will not undergo constructive interference? Yes, it will also undergo, but to a lesser extent. The intensity will not be as high as for 500 nanometer. If you see the output of the detector, you will always see it like this. So this would be 500 nanometer and 499 would be just to the left of it. That means slightly lower intensity. 498 will be still lower, 497 still lower, like this. A number of wavelengths will undergo constructive interference, but 500 undergoes complete constructive interference and others partial constructive interference in decreasing order as you move away from 500 nanometers. So that's the role of the thickness of this transparent layer. Okay. And uh, these interference filters are uh, uh, the best for, in so far as filters are considered, best in the sense they give narrow bandwidths. Uh, the, uh, usually the bandwidths uh, are approximately 1.5% of the nominal uh, wavelength. We saw what was the nominal wavelength. It's the central wavelength in that peak um, of the output of wavelength selector. So 1.5% of that would be the bandwidth. They are quite narrow compared to the next type of filter that we will see. And uh, the bandwidth can be further reduced uh, to uh, almost 0.15% uh, in some narrow band interference filters. That is also being done. So interference filters are quite good in that way. Now, this next type is the absorption filters. These are generally less expensive. 
and more rugged than the interference filters. But uh, as uh, seen here, they can be used only with visible radiation. They are manufactured from dyed glass or pigmented gelatin raisins. So like you see, this is a filter and you see this dyed glass or pigmented gelatin raisin. Some colored glass is used. And because we are dealing with colors, we say it can be used only with visible radiation. So what exactly happens here uh, is since you are using this colored glass, this type of filter uh, removes part of the incident radiation by absorption. So depending upon what colored glass you are having, its complementary color will get transmitted. So here you have uh, sorry, the complementary color will be restricted and uh, the color that you see that gets transmitted. So you have a magenta filter, it will absorb green light and transmit magenta light. Okay, because uh, green and uh, purple or magenta are complementary colors. So you have a purple filter, then it will transmit purple light and completely restrict green light so uh, if you have a green solution you will use a purple filter okay you want to estimate a green solution then you have to ensure green light is restricted because green light cannot be absorbed by a green solution green solution will absorb complementary color purple and that's why the wavelength selector should allow purple light to pass through and therefore we use purple this is how absorption filters are used. Absorption filters have effective bandwidth that range from 30 to 250 nanometers. So uh, quite a large uh, effective bandwidth. Um, that is why not very accurate, but filters that provide the narrowest bandwidth, that is around 30, um, they also will absorb a significant fraction of the desired wavelength and uh, may have a transmittance of 1% or less at their band peak. So suppose say in this case, purple light will correspond to the band peak, but only uh, this filter will partly absorb the purple light also. Uh, and only probably 1% or less will be coming through. Therefore the intensity of radiation coming out of an absorption filter is always less. So if you want high intensity, then it's better to avoid absorption filters. So the bandwidths are wider, can be used only with visible radiation. Uh, advantage, they are less expensive, more rugged. And you have these filters for all the regions of visible uh, region and how they are made and what is the operation. We have just seen glass filters with transmittance maxima throughout the entire visible region are available commercially. So though their performance characteristics are uh, less than uh, that of interference filters, uh, but they are perfectly adequate for many routine applications. So this is a comparison of bandwidths of interference and absorption filters. This is percentage transmittance and versus the wavelength. You will see a, a output of an interference filter like this, whereas the output of an absorption filter looks like this. So what does it tell you? The radiation coming out of an interference filter from the same source, we are talking about from the same source. When you compare, you will see radiation output from an interference filter is high intensity compared to what comes out of an absorption filter. So it, this has more advantage than the absorption filter. Second re refers to the effective bandwidth. The effective bandwidth of interference filter is much lesser than that of absorption filter. If you take on an average, this is around 10 nanometer, whereas this is about 50 nanometer. Okay, so that's a huge difference. Uh, how many wavelengths will be passing and falling on the sample? You can imagine if it is 50 nanometer. If it's plus minus 50 nanometer, still more. 
so here you see the advantages, but the only advantage of absorption filter is it's much lower cost compared to interference filters. And also it's a rugged one, does not break down easily, whereas interference filters are more delicate and should be handled here. So do you have any questions from today's portions? Yes? Do you have any questions? Any doubts? No. No, ma'am. Um, 